lights just seem to be so bright Honey, babe, maybe you're right But I forgot just how to fight On and on and on and on guys are Sarah Voss, <laughs> Daniel Wolf. Hey. Dead Horses is here. How are you guys doing? Good. <laughs> How are you? In, great. You know, incredibly accomplished too, by the way, guys, for my audience. I mean, as musicians, as solo artists, um, now as authors, Sarah, which we'll talk about in a second. And this album, by the way, guys, got to tell you, Brady Street, I mean, you guys just put it out recently. Guys, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. The storytelling in the songs, the title track, the characters, Ward under gray skies. It's just like spectacular. Congratulations, guys. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate That's it. Good. Yeah, man. It's really, really great. And, and Sarah, isn't it amazing? Because I was thinking about you, like when the pandemic hit, you went back to your hometown. You know, you quickly got a job in the grocery store. Things were, you know, existential doubts galore in your yep. world. Isn't it a beautiful thing? you know, that you're back here, you know, you just rocked the Americana Fest, you're thriving to a point where <laughs> you guys are like a household name. It's, it's, isn't it amazing that like, you know, you were in that like doubtful place and now like now you're back here. Yeah, I, when I think about uh, during the lockdown, it just seems kind of like a dream now. Um, once in a while, like when I was working at the grocery store, um, my favorite shift was when I would go in before it opened and stock stuff. So you could like listen to music on your phone. And there was this one record by Bonobo I used to listen to all the time when I was like stocking produce and sweating. And I heard that the other day and it, it took me like right back to those early mornings stocking produce. And uh, yeah, life is just life is crazy like that. It's a pretty strange world we live in. Yeah, I love that. I love that comeback story. You know, comeback is always better than the setback. We we love to yeah. say here. And uh, there's something I wanted to ask you guys. And I don't know how to articulate this, honestly, guys. And it's it, because I'm not a musician, so my apologies. But there's certain moments in some of your songs. Uh, there's certain songs like like the other day, you know, I was hearing I was hearing Free Falling by Tom Petty, for example, mm -hmm. or your song On and On or Turntable, that you hit certain notes, Sarah and Dan. Like you hit certain notes it just literally runs up like my spine. It's, I think in writing hit songs, there has to be like a certain trick, like with paintings, you know, like to bring people in. And there's certain notes you guys hit. Like when you do like, honey, you know, honey, babe, did I do you wrong? You know, on mm -hmm. and on and on. That it just like gives you like something spiritual. I don't know how to articulate this question, but you guys know what I mean, right? I think so. I think it's like, um, I think it has something to do with, with there being something put out there artistically that like that everyone can relate to you know what I mean like it can be different for every person but it's it's a sentiment that is kind of universal I think that has something to do with it but what you speak of is pretty kind of mysterious you know like we talk about the muse yeah yeah so in other words Sarah like you know you cannot sit down and say I'm going to play a, a major chord and then I'm going to play a minor or whatever. It has to be like something like profound from the soul, right? Yeah. Lately I've been thinking about it. It has to be vulnerable. 
uh, I think, I think art has to be vulnerable. I think if it's not vulnerable, it's like, what are, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Dan? Anything to add there? Um, yeah, I think it's instinctual sort of output. It's just got to be what you think sounds good to your ears. And then you got to kind of just trust that it's not like it, the more formulaic it becomes, the more maybe contrived or in my opinion, maybe it's just less interesting. So I like hearing how other musicians create music. And usually it's just like, this is what sounded good to me. This is what I would want to hear. And that's a whole trick in and of itself. It's about being able to put what you hear in your head out onto a page, but that's not always the case either. Sometimes it's, you kind of have to spew out a lot of stuff and then you come across those magical moments. So yeah. 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 It's incredible. It's all about your ears. Absolutely. It's got to be authentic, like you guys say. And that's what Dead Horses does so well, guys. And this year, Dan, let's stay with you. I mean, you guys have had an incredible, successful year. I was just talking off camera with Sarah. Uh, you know, you guys rocked Americana Fresh, play, played the Brooklyn Bowl, you know, before Lucas Nelson and all that stuff. Um, you know, shows in Washington, D.C., the East Coast, all around the country. What are some pinch me moments you've had this year, Dan, where you're like, hell yeah. Fuck Did yeah. you say uh, what, what kind of moments exactly? Pinch me. Pinch me moments. Pinch me moments. Um, probably just like jumping back on the road, the whole culmination of a tour and not have really done that since early 2020. Yeah. Um, so getting back into the swing of that, that's a pinch me moment because up until then, uh, throughout 2021 and the first part of 2022, we were doing weekend dates. We were doing little travel dates here and there, but getting on the road for an extended amount of time, every day was like, you kind of have to like pinch yourself a little bit. It's like, oh yeah, there's, there's no turning back. You're, you're just going, you know, um, which was something I had that I'm adapting back into. It's, it's, it's crazy. Any one show though, a pinch me moment for a show. Um, yeah, probably Americana Fest. Um, mm -hmm. That this year was amazing because we kept ourselves really busy. We also had a lot of fun. So we kept enough time to have a lot of fun. Um, I definitely personally wore myself thin, but had so much fun doing it. And then the shows and working with uh, publicity on this record, that was such a huge help to line up a lot of really cool recording sessions. We got to go in, into um, people's homes and some really iconic old studios and just record what we got to do. You know, we get to play our music, which is amazing. And to do it in all these different spaces, it's truly, uh, it's very humbling and it's it feels good to do it. Absolutely. And Sarah, you know, we have a bunch of friends here that are on the road so, so much and we spend a lot of time on the road and it's not easy. You know, people don't know the grind. People don't see the, uh, you know, when you're driving with Dan and you're, you know, X hours and you're stopping at gas stations and, and the food. But what are the moments, Sarah, where you're like, you know, you're in the middle of tour right now. What are the magical moments that you say, man, this is exactly why everything, everything is worth it. You know, the flat tires, the uh the sleepy nights what are like the moments Sarah where you're like this is why definitely when we're playing the music and I think Dan and I were just talking about this last week like we were talking about some of the the obstacles and and just things that you have to really work hard at like like the driving um this tour we just finished up we did 16 shows in 18 days and we traveled or, uh, just over 4,000 miles so you're driving and you're playing every day but the the music the music playing the music uh and experiencing the event with the other people that's always the most fulfilling part that that's like the meat and potatoes that's why you do it yeah absolutely and sarah i have to ask you i mean one of the great things about dead horses i think one of the themes that came out in research is resiliency i think that you guys are so resilient and it's like it, it's why the success you guys are having and will continue to have it's like more valuable and it makes us smile even more because of, you know, life has thrown you curveballs like many bands, but you guys have been able to create light out of them. And, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about this, but just the name of your band, you know, an honor to a friend of yours that passed. If you don't mind giving us a little bit more detail about, about this friend and, and kind of what, like what he meant to you and what, what you think when you think his name. Yeah, we, we called him kitten. I'm not sure why that was his nickname. Um, and, I first met him in high school before, before Dead Horses was even a project. Um, and he was friends of a couple brothers that I knew. Um, 
I then went off to college and ended up coming back to my hometown. And that's where I met Dan. He had met the same people Hmm. and we started playing music with them. And it was such an important kind of, uh, time of almost like training, like learning how to, how to be in a band. I had done a lot of musical stuff before I had been in bands too, but, um, during this like kind of formative part of our history, learned a lot and, and had a lot of fun nights playing with other people. And Kitten was just a person that was around uh, the scene. You know, he was a friend. He was he was a close friend of um, a couple members that were in the band at that time. And they also struggled with uh, addiction, with opioids. Sure. And I was like, you know, I was in my early 20s. I didn't really know anything ab- about it. You know, like I didn't know any, I didn't know how serious that addiction was. I think a lot of people didn't. And, um, and I watched them, I watched them suffer through that and be, you know, someone very, very close to, to both Dan and me. And, um, so when they, <clears throat> when Tyler was his name, he was, he was the one that kind of threw out the name for the band. I remember thinking like, Ooh, that's just a dark name. You know, like, I don't know if I like that. And, and he said to me, he's like, well, do you have any, any, yeah. um, do you have, have, have any other suggestions? And I said, no. And we kind of stuck with that name. And it wasn't until actually later that I learned it. I'm not sure how I learned the true meaning behind the name. Mm-hmm. And Kitten's mom would actually come to all these shows that we would play the first couple summers. And I think for her too, it felt like um, it was a way for her to process, like like being a part of the the, the project, the band, coming to the shows, that was like a way for her to process some of the grief she was going through as music is for me too. Music has always been one way of, of processing, not just grief, but like just life in general, right? Like Agreed. That's what mm-hmm. art is. And um, so as time, yeah, as time progressed, it seemed like the name just fit better and better and better and better. And it would have always felt anytime we asked ourselves if we should change it, I always felt like that would just be doing like an injustice to our past and who we are. And um, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, very well said there, Sarah. And you can't change the name now because it's a household name. Speaking of of you guys becoming a household name, Dan, um, you know, I I found it interesting. I mean, Brady Street is like the first album you guys do in in a minute, in like, you know, like four years or something, at least officially out. I know it's been ready for a while. But let me ask you this. um, you know, any any pressure, Dan, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you guys were starting out, basically you had a blank canvas. You guys could do whatever you wanted, you know, really go in any direction. Now, you know, when you guys bring out a new album, there is some anticipation, you know. It may not be Beyonce's right. album yet, but, you know, but there is like a name, there's a standard that you guys have put to yourselves. Any um, Any constraints there or any uneasiness when you start a new project? Um, actually, I almost feel like it was, it's kind of the opposite because when we first started recording records, we were, and Sarah had mentioned, we were kind of new to playing in this band and we had kind of a thing we jumped into, especially because of these other brothers, we were playing more of a bluegrass string band style of music in our own way, because we also didn't come from that camp per se, but we were doing something in that, in that realm. Um, I feel like as we progress in every album we put out, and especially on Brady Street here, we almost have more of a blank canvas because I appreciate, Sarah, we've talked about this too, how we like how bands kind of morph into a new thing as they continue to put out music. And we feel like that's an appropriate thing because you, you don't want to hear this the a band putting out the same sort of sound all the time. Um, I think we've kind of just gradually uh, progressed with our sound as each album we put out. So I felt like going, especially coming out of the pandemic and us deciding to record Brady Street, we kind of had more of a, I didn't really feel much pressure. And um, I I don't know if Sarah, you could, um, if you would agree with that, but I felt like we had more areas to kind of run with it and try new things and feel okay about it and just know that this is what we do. Um, The best part is that there's musicians and groups of musicians all around us putting stuff out. So 
just to be a part of that, um, it, it, it feels freeing. It doesn't feel like Dead Horses has to really be anything. It It's not. It can just be what it is. So it felt very liberating to go in and record this record because we were working with really great people. Um, our drummer, Jamie, was with us, who's a great musical asset to us. He has great ideas and he, he brings uh, really good uh, aspects out of both Sarah and I, even individually, I believe. Absolutely. And within the unit as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think there was much of a pressure to do any one thing. We were just going to make the best sounds and songs that we could. Love that. Love that, Dan. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I'm super. I mean, and you can tell because like the album is just phenomenal. There's so much oxygen, you know, in, in everything. It's, it's just a great listen. Sarah, you know, you guys have been so good with your time, but I have to ask you about your, you know, you just announced that you're going to maybe like do a book. Tell us a little bit about this. I mean, love to hear it. You guys are amazing writers, songwriters, obviously. So when did you start thinking about this and, and what's the project like? Yeah. So I, it, I actually just came out this book. Um, amazing. Yeah. I started writing it kind of, um, it's, it's, it's half kind of poetry, half prose. Uh, it's, it's, almost it was it was kind of a an experiment in journaling for me mm. um I don't know how I came up with this way but I've always journaled and it was kind of getting to a point where I'm like I don't know this journaling is it's I don't ever want it to be like trying to record what happens day to day like I want it to be more uh free more free form mm. and that was kind of my experiment to do with not necessarily any intention of releasing any of them or letting anyone see them um but I kept I kept right but it was a little bit in my head you know and then I I just kept writing that and so you know it started before COVID goes through COVID and then after and uh then I was just approached by um kind of a, a friend uh from the Twin Cities area and they're starting a, just a very small publishing company and he asked me if I would want to write a book and I was like well kind of have already <laughs> um but I had to go through and do like a ton of editing and it doesn't include everything obviously sure. um but it's just it's it's very honest and vulnerable and it's just a little snapshot of uh things that I was seeing every day on the road and feeling and um yeah and that's that's what it is and we can get it on uh, on Amazon or like link in your in your website or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You can you can uh, on uh, social media profiles. There's a website there. You can get it through mine. Um, Perfect. We'll put it up. We'll put it up. Awesome. Perfect. Well, guys, you you guys have said all. Oh, Dan, let me leave you with this. Dan, what is happening in Milwaukee? Be and the reason why I ask is because there's like three or four musicians we deeply respect who have packed up their bags in Nashville and gone to Milwaukee. So I feel like what is happening? I need to know, Dan. I, I think I need to know too. Um, <laughs> uh, there, more and more I see that there's tons of shows happening. Um, there's a lot of live music coming through Milwaukee. A lot of live music is also kind of uh, avoiding Milwaukee and they're not doing that intentionally, but Milwaukee can be kind of a flyover city for a lot of touring musicians. But it's cool to see that I think there is a very lively music scene here. The local music scene is quite lively. There's, there's a lot of uh, folk Americana string band music too. Um, uh, but at the same time, I need to dive more into it as well. It, it feels like even being gone for like the better part of a month, it's like, oh, what was going on while I was gone? And um, getting to like stop out to shows or whatever now that I'm home it's like on any given night you can find live music and go find something to do um who are these musicians per se do you yeah absolutely okay. I mean I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, send them to you via email just uh, I don't know I don't know if they want to okay. public or whatever yeah but like sure. but yeah yeah it's it's happening it's a thing cool well yeah <laughs> Milwaukee's a great place I think um Sarah and I experienced this too in Oshkosh when we started the band in Oshkosh it was like such a vibrant music scene, especially for a smaller community. Yes, they have the college and um, it's kind of positioned in an area between a kind of a metropolis of the Fox Valley between Fond du Lac, Green Bay, Appleton, right. 
Nina Menashe in Green, in Green Bay, like I said. Um, Milwaukee is the same thing. It's a great place. It's, uh, I feel like it's a supportive community. Um, it's, it's a big city, but it's small enough that you can kind of wrap your mind around it. And you can find the, the support where, where, if you're willing to work hard, you can find the support from people. I, love that's, it. I think that's an awesome thing. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Sarah Voss, Daniel Wolf, you guys have said it all. I mean, Dead Horse is incredible duo, guys. What, what a band. What an album, guys. Congratulations. I mean, every song, it just keeps getting better with every listen. So we look forward to what's next for you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for having us on the show. It's a pleasure Absolutely. to talk to you. Bye, guys. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.